Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. A person's cremated remains left out in the open for more than a week. Now police are involved in an effort to find out who put them there. Glad you're with us for Local 4 News at 6. I'm Devin Skillion. And I'm Christy McDonald in for Kimberly Gill tonight. You never know what you might see while out for a walk. And for a couple in Taylor, it was something that they really couldn't ignore. Uh, they were walking through Oak Grove Burial Ground near Van Bourne and Telegraph. They saw a box containing cremated, rem uh, cremated remains. Sean Lay live with the search for answers on, I guess, several fronts here, actually, Sean. That's right, and Chris Land and his wife, they come through here all the time. It's a peaceful place to walk. Let me show you what they found right over here. Off to the side on top of this mound of dirt, the cremated remains in a box. Now, Chris is working to get the remains back into caring hands, not left out here like this. What happens when someone finds ashes in a home and there is no next of kin? Caring questions tonight from Chris Land. He walks Taylor-owned Oak Grove Cemetery for exercise. Ten days ago, he made this alarming discovery. Someone's loved one named Michael O'Brien. His cremated remains dumped off to the side here, discarded with no dignity. Land called the city of Taylor on April 3rd. We came on another walk and it's still sitting here. More than a week? What are you going to do if you get in touch with someone and now it's not there anymore? We connected with Taylor Police. The chief tells us police will safeguard the box until next of kin is found. Next, records should be at the cremation facility showing which funeral home the cremated remains were released to. The funeral home should have records showing who they released the remains to. Is that person alive or no longer with us? Did a person find the remains in a house and just dump them here? Kind of a big deal to find some unburied person and not have the city respond for over a week. Now we've been working on this all day. Chris has been working on this all day. He believes he's found names of family members and phone numbers. All those numbers we called are no longer in service. And then we also discovered this. This is the authorization for cremation for Michael O'Brien, who died at age 876 in 1996. The remains released to a family member on Detroit's east side. All the phone numbers connected the family members no longer in service tonight. So still a mystery who brought them here and still a, a lot of work to do to get them in the right hands tonight. Devin, Christy. Sean, obviously this is something that does not happen very often. Uh, you don't come across this, but since we have seen this now, what do you do if you find cremated remains? We've seen it before. This is the takeaway here. We connected with Brian Joseph. He is with Verheiden Funeral Home over in Gross Point. Don't remember him. He has handled hundreds and hundreds of cases just like this. He says, call a funeral home for guidance. Do just not just don't leave them out in the open for yeah. someone else to have to do all the backtracking and work with this. All right. All right, Sean. Disturbing testimony in graphic detail continued for a second day in a Farmington Hills courtroom. Former youth hockey player is taking the stand accusing their team doctor of sexual assault. Jacqueline Francis has been in the courtroom and she's joining us live tonight. Jacqueline, this testimony, it was really difficult to listen to. Christy, it was. So imagine how difficult it was for these young men to take the stand and share their story, sparing no detail, all while facing the man they once called the mentor. 12 witnesses in two days, the hockey doc in court for it all. So you felt that you were touched inappropriately, correct? 100%. That witness was just 14 years old when it happened. In total, 11 men came forward, accusing the Farmington Hills urologist of sexual assault, including inappropriate touching, massages, and naked yoga. All but one met Leverin through youth hockey, where he volunteered as the team doctor. You don't hear this happening to that many guys, and I felt really alone. One by one, the former players accused the doc of violating a position of trust. And it was just kind of the thing that freaked me out was thinking that I might have been groomed since I was a kid. Several of the men said the assaults didn't happen until they were young adults seeking out Leverin for various medical reasons. I really liked Doc and I'm somebody I trusted and someone that had helped me out. I couldn't believe it was happening. I struggled with that after I, I left too. Leverin is facing roughly 30 counts of sexual misconduct. What was going through your mind at that point then? Um, I was just kind of in shock, really. Um, I've never had that done by a doctor, but I didn't really want to. I 
didn't know what to do. I kind of like shut down and just let it happen. It'll be up to a judge to decide whether he stands trial. All of the witnesses have been called. The attorneys will pick up their arguments next month. In the meantime, Zvi Levin is being held on a $3 million bond. Reporting live in Farmington Hills, Jacqueline Francis, Local 4. All right, thanks so much, Jacqueline. A new report from an education advocacy group puts forth the claim that 90% of Michigan students attend schools without sufficient funding. And they say most of those students need a boost of about $2,000 each in funding to give them a proper education. Rob Maloney with us now live tonight with a look at what they're saying and whether it is, uh, I, I guess the, the, the word would be at all practical, Rod. Well, yeah, exactly, Devin. We're out here at Lamphere High School in Madison Heights. And take a look at this. Right now, the state's spending $19 billion. That's the budget for this year. But according to this study, it is 25% below what it should be. They say it needs to be higher by about 25%. So there are a lot of people wondering, well, where's this money going to come from? Michigan students are still trying to recover from COVID after spending so much time away from the classroom. And that's baked into this year's budget. But Michigan Education Association labor economist Tanner Delpier says. While the state has made progress in the last few years, there's still a long way to go to get to the funding levels and funding structures that will provide students with the education they deserve. Oak Park State Representative Regina Weiss chairs the School Aid and Education Appropriations Subcommittee. And she says they're looking for ways to find that kind of money. We realize that we're still a far cry away from what um, is required of us and what we need to be providing to our students across the state. And they're looking to tackle the usual school funding issues like small class sizes, student support such as counselors, paraprofessional aides, and social workers, health professionals, school libraries, special education, and preschool. Yet other studies will tell you spending on that level doesn't often equate to better test scores. Mackinac Policy Center Research Director Michael Van Beek tells Local 4. What matters most is teacher quality, meaning uh, having excellent teachers in the classrooms. And the Mackinac Center has sparred with the MEA and the governor, saying that they're getting this education funding issue wrong. And unfortunately, cheered on by the MEA, Governor Whitmer and the legislature has been working in the opposite direction, making it harder to get excellent teachers in the classroom because they're watering down standards for teachers and schools. And so here's the other problem. That $19 billion is largely backfilled by federal COVID dollars. Now that money has been spent. What do you do? So the, the funding level could be closer to 15 billion dollars and so now all of a sudden you've got like about a 50 percent deficit based on their study and so what they're saying they need to do is to look around and figure out ways that they can find other places to take money because they know raising taxes on a grand scale is not going to be popular reporting live in madison heights rod maloney local four there's new information on a deadly accident that shut down part of Telegraph Road in Ash Township this morning. It happened just before 5 a.m. on Telegraph near Carlton Rockwood Road. Police say a 55-year-old woman walking in the middle of a traffic lane and wearing all dark clothing was hit by a semi-truck. The truck driver crossed the center line in an effort to avoid hitting the woman who was pronounced dead at the scene. The crash remains under investigation, but we are told that speed and alcohol do not appear to be factors. New proposed rules from the EPA could accelerate America's move toward electric vehicles, making most new passenger cars EVs within the next decade. The focus is on battling the climate crisis, of course, but the White House also says the regulations would strengthen jobs and the economy while cutting reliance on foreign oil. The Biden administration is betting big on electric. We're driving towards a clean energy future. Today, the Environmental Protection Agency proposed new car emission standards that could require electric vehicles to account for up to two-thirds of new cars sold in the U.S. by 2032. We're starting to see uh, all of the uh, auto industry move in this direction. Transportation is the biggest source of greenhouse pollution in the U.S., with light-duty vehicles accounting for 58 percent of those emissions. EPA Administrator Michael Reagan says the goal is not only to tackle the climate crisis, but to bolster the U.S. economy long term. This is a really exciting proposal that codifies the president's vision for an electric future that wins the day in manufacturing and jobs as well. 
The rules are intended to push the auto industry toward electrification and increase supply. We see that consumers are really responsive to uh, EVs when they get their hands on them. Still, not everyone is ready to buy in. 41% of Americans polled by Gallup last month said they would not buy an EV. But the White House is hoping tax incentives, like a credit of up to $7,500 for new EV purchases, will help drive Americans to electrify. We're going to save consumers money. This is a huge opportunity for everyone in this country. If approved, the emission standards would start in model year 2027 vehicles. As for new medium-duty vehicles like delivery trucks, the EPA thinks the new rules could mean half of those models would be electric by 2032. A scam alert involving jury duty. The Livingston County Sheriff's Office is warning everyone to be aware of fraudulent phone calls and emails telling people that they've missed jury duty and that they owe fines. The scammers are pressuring people to give up personal info to pay the fine, threatening prosecution if they don't. If you get one of these calls or emails, please call the Livingston County Sheriff's Office to report it. All right, here's a live look at our brand new Southfield Skycam. Folks there enjoying another beautiful okay. day along with just about everyone in Metro Detroit. Cannot find a cloud Ooh. anywhere. Yeah. Temperatures have reached into the 80s. Kim Adams yeah. here with a look at a beautiful day. Kim. The only thing that would make it better if this, those trees were green. There you go. Right? Well, you would. It's rare that <laughs> we see 80 degrees along. when the trees are not green yet. Last time we hit 80 was 89 back on September 21st. So it's been quite some time since we've been in the 80s, but we made it today. 80 at Metro now, 82 at City Airport, still lagging behind in Pontiac, 79. Port Huron's at 81 and Mount Clemens, you were at 80 last hour now down to 79. It's warmer than it was yesterday by about five to seven, even eight degrees in Pontiac, seven degrees warmer today than yesterday in Mount Clemens. And believe it or not, we'll be even warmer for the day tomorrow as temperatures get well into the low 80s. We'll see a high of about 83. So by four o'clock back down to 82, eight o'clock at night in April. We'll have a little bit of sun before it sets and temperatures in the 70s. So, of course, it's not going to last forever. So I've got to show you this seven day forecast. Wish, wish we could just live in the moment, but you need to see it for the weekend. Yep. Sounds good.